happy to announce that the Fretboard Journal now has three presenting sponsors. These are three brands that are behind us with everything that we do, including the podcasts and the videos, and they include Carter Vintage, Carter Vintage Guitars, where guitar lovers go for a good time, Gibson Guitars, only a Gibson is good enough, and last but not least, Martin Guitars. Martin Guitars and Strings remain the choice for musicians around the world for their unrivaled quality, craftsmanship, and tone can't thank these three brands enough for being presenting sponsors thank you guys welcome to the fretboard journal podcast i'm jason verlindy the editor and publisher of the fretboard journal magazine as always that is john rowhouse playing in the background thank you so much for tuning in if you are listening to this podcast i have a feeling you like guitars maybe you even like collecting guitars and imagine if you will Getting to collect guitars, but not having to explain anything to your significant other or your accountant and not having to worry quite so much about your own personal finances. That is the job that today's podcast guest Richard Walter has. He is a curator over at Phoenix, Arizona's incredible musical instrument museum. We talk on this show about all sorts of stuff with Richard. I had a blast hearing uh, what a day in the life is for him some of the finds that he's been able to procure for the museum, and most importantly, about the incredibly cool electric guitar exhibit that they have going on now through the middle of September. If you are anywhere near Arizona or Southern California or just like to uh, get some sunshine and warmth in your life, head on down there because what is very cool about the electric guitar exhibit that they have going on is it's not just rock star stuff. It is uh, a very eclectic mix. Everything they do down there is pretty eclectic. They've got Alvino Ray's guitar. They've got the Bigsby that Speedy West played that was featured in the Fretboard Journal 44. They've got Bo Diddley guitars and Pete Townsend guitars, but they've got all this other stuff too, all this weird stuff that was so pivotal in the development of the electric guitar but maybe doesn't get as much attention as the guitar that Jimi Hendrix smashed at one of his shows. So check out the exhibit. Uh, I hope you enjoy our conversation with Richard. I had a blast talking to him, and uh, it sounds like the Musical Instrument Museum has all sorts of cool concerts going on all year long, so um, definitely check them out if you find yourself anywhere near Arizona. We are hard at work putting the finishing touches on the Fretboard Journal 45. That's going to be mailing out in a little over a month by popular demand, we are also putting out another Fretboard Journal Electric Guitar Annual for 2019. This is going to mail out in late October. We're going to have a pre-order link on the website very soon, but you can email us as well. If you want us to send you the link, just shoot me a note at jason at fretboardjournal.com. I also want to give a shout out to our other sponsor this week, Mono Cases. You can go to monocreators.com to see what these guys are up to, but they create some of the world's finest gig bags. I'm personally rocking the Mono Vertigo case for my parts caster. I take it everywhere. It is comfortable. It is protective. It has all the right pockets. And the cool thing about Mono is they're not only sponsoring this podcast, they're sponsoring everything else that we do here at the Fretboard Journal, including the slick cardboard mailers that all the subscribers get so that no postman ever ding up your copies of the print fretboard journal. So thank you guys. Go to monocreators.com to read up on what they are all about. And I guess now we should cut to my conversation with Richard Walter. Rich, thanks for being on the fretboard journal podcast. Uh, I think you have one of the most coveted jobs around. (laughs) Can you, uh, can you explain what you do? Sure. Uh, well, yes. Yeah. I'm the currently the curator for USA, Canada, and Europe here at the Musical Instrument Museum in Phoenix, Arizona, and we've got a curatorial department of of five people who really spread our primary responsibilities uh, geographically. So we're a global museum, and uh, you know our, our job is to help shape some of the content that folks will see when they come visit the museum. So it is a, a really amazing job to keep on learning about instruments from around the world and trying to bring them together in a, a public environment where people can learn about music and the people who played them. And, uh, you know, it's just an ongoing constant process because music never ends. You know, music itself is evolving and, and will never will never reach the end of what people are doing. So so it's a lot of fun to keep on evolving the museum and telling new stories. Yeah. 
I sadly have yet to uh, visit the Musical Instrument Museum down in Phoenix, but uh, have you been there since the very beginning? I have not. So we opened in 2010. Uh, We're actually coming up on our 10th anniversary uh, this coming April in 2020. So by museum terms, it's it's fairly young, uh, but we're really excited about everything that's happened even in a short 10 years. I began in late 2014. Okay. And so for folks who may just be hearing about this place for the first time, like it's not just guitars. It's like the entire world of musical instruments, right? Yeah, a- absolutely. So um, MIM is really one of a kind, and it's it's easy to say that with a straight face. There are music-related uh, museums and, and organizations around the world, but MIM is really the only place that has a uh, a particular focus on musical instruments and performance traditions, and we represent those from every nation and territory on earth. And so it's a it's a huge facility. We have about 80,000 square feet of gallery space. And, uh, you know, in addition to some specialized thematic galleries, we really do have these geographic galleries where people can explore the world of music quite literally and just flow from one place to the next learning about uh, the instruments and the sounds and the people who play these instruments from from everywhere so it's a really sweeping place but oddly enough especially for uh, for folks who subscribe and read the fretboard journal in our orientation spaces some of the introductory areas we actually use the guitar we have a dedicated guitar gallery uh, aside from even this special project w- that we have on the electric guitar, but we have a guitar gallery because the guitar is a recognizable instrument and it's a nice point of entry into thinking about the diversity of music from around the world because we have examples uh, through history and also from from different countries to see what it means to have a guitar through different time periods and and different genres and different nations. And if that kind of diversity can exist on just one type of thing called a guitar, you sort of magnify that by all the different types of instruments there are in the world and all the diversity, and it just kind of explodes from there. But we use the guitar as a really um, kind of common point of introduction to to the kinds of diversity and and styles and designs that that people will find in every family of instruments yeah and and you guys right now uh to cut to the chase have an insanely cool electric guitar exhibit going on right now that i think we have about a month folks have about a month left to visit but um before we get to that Let's. How did you get this job? Are you a, a musical instrument historian, or were you a dealer, or what was your background? No. So the the capsule comment. My background is in ethnomusicology and okay. folklore. So um, I studied with the folklore and ethnomusicology department at Indiana University. Prior to that, I really loved archaeology and anthropology. And I was actually going to school in Lexington, Virginia, Rockbridge County, Virginia, where they have an incredible bluegrass and old time scene. And uh, when I was first getting into that, oddly enough, I was also, you know, in the library, there was a great copy of of uh, George Gruen and Walter's Carter, Walter Carter's book about fretted American instruments. Mm-hmm. And uh, David Grisman had recently come out with his tone poems sure. projects where it really kind of specifies the sounds of, of, of instruments associated with the songs you're listening to. And all those things were really exciting to me, um, frankly, just from the standpoint of material culture, you know, studying archaeology and, and material things and then loving music and then being in an environment in Lexington where people were, you know, every Wednesday morning, you go down to the the coffee shop and you'd see people with these really cool old Brazilian Rosewood Martins and a really nice F5 mandolin and a really nice old banjo. And so all those things were coming to life. And, um, and that was really exciting for me. And it, it turned my attention in this direction and I kept on pursuing it and going down that path and, uh, specializing it a little bit. And then, uh, a job opportunity opened up in 2014, which was perfect timing for me when I was looking for something next to do. I was living in Southern Indiana at the time and MIM is out in Phoenix and I'd never spent any time in this part of the country, but, but the museum is such a unique place and I was really grateful to get the opportunity to come out. So I didn't hesitate and, and 
started and since then have had some different um, responsibilities and it's been a lot of fun evolving here as well but that's how I got into it was from anthropology and material culture and then ultimately ethnomusicology yeah and and obviously there are big uh showcase exhibits going on every year, you, you know, that are booked out and you probably have your plans for what you're going to show off for the next couple of years. But in a typical day in your life, are you still out there? Are you out in the field looking for instruments to supply the museum with, or what does your job entail? Yeah. So we're always looking for items that will continue to enhance the collection. It's interesting because we're, we're really not in the business of accumulating things so we're not trying to be the like the biggest collection of instruments or to have uh, one of everything in the world much less three of everything in the world Um, but we are always wanting for our strongest you know the strongest parts of the collection to be out on display and really carrying the stories of real music making out in the world or historical traditions that that still resonate with people today. And so when we started, uh, I mean, it's such a huge undertaking to to want to represent the whole world. And so we had the help of, I think, a hundred or so specialists from around the world who had ties to various communities and could help us uh, sort of initially populate all the galleries with good representative instruments so that every place was reflected in the in the kinds of things people would see but but now it's just the ongoing process of thinking where is there room for improvement where is there a part of the world where maybe uh, we need to rethink how it's been uh, represented and we need to connect with people there or uh, connect with existing you know legacy performers who may still have really special instruments in their personal collections and gradually keep on bringing things with extra layers of authenticity or meaning for for the people who might come in and get really charged up to see uh you know their own heroes personal instruments for instance so that's that's an ongoing i think endless process so we spend a lot of time pursuing those um and because mim has generated more and more reputation over time. It's It's been a great magnet for people who approach us with really interesting instruments and say, you know, um, my grandparents had this. Do you have any reason to have this in your collection? Or I've been collecting these things for a long, long time, and it's time to, to think about where they should go next. And so we, we actually end up interacting a whole lot with, with folks who seek MIM out as a potential next home for some of their special instruments. And that's a lot of fun too. That's amazing. And, and do you, obviously you have a budget who decides what's important for MIM for the next five or 10 years? Um, who decides where you get to write those checks? Yeah, well, that's, that's a kind of a joint effort between the curatorial team and certainly the, the leadership at the museum who has a, a real keen understanding of what we have in the galleries and the directions we want to go and the communities we, we really obviously want to reflect as proudly as we can. So there's a, a collective awareness of all those things, but then ultimately the, the curatorial department uh, kind of continuously stays in touch with each other and has opportunities to propose new acquisitions or, uh, you know, portions of collections that we may have encountered uh, in various fieldwork endeavors or, you know, just kind of that organic networking that happens. You run into new relationships all the time. And so we we try to share those ideas and and, uh, use those resources as best we can because we're still a nonprofit. We still are really mindful of, of trying to, make the most sense out of what are the most impactful ways we can improve the collection, tell stronger stories, have thought provoking instruments on display. And and there's a kind of an interesting balance between all those considerations, which is a lot of fun. Um, Because again, it's not just a, uh, it's not a, a task of just getting more and more and more. That'd be very, very different. So with limited storage, uh, available and, and all kinds of other considerations, we, we end up being really selective, but that's not to say we can't stay very active in looking for, for really high quality and interesting thought provoking instruments. Sure. Sure. That makes perfect sense. I, I once got to go in the bowels of the experience music project and was floored by how many yeah. amazing instruments 
were not on display. <laughs> I mean, it was right for my taste more interesting than what was on display at the time. But yeah, well, and and for us, uh, part of that advantage is the galleries are changing quite frequently. So it's not a static museum. And, and we really believe that since music is not a static uh, field, then, then the gallery shouldn't be either. And even though we always have really strong things on display, of course, we do have some in storage and that gives us an opportunity over time to dip back into our own permanent collection and revise an existing display and that may be uh you know the music of germany or uh polka music or or any number of thematic kinds of things but but it's a lot of fun to rethink how we do that and sometimes mobilize some parts that are some parts of the collection that are currently in storage that that need to rotate into pub, public display and it's really rewarding to see some of those really neat instruments that we've known about in in the collection uh, kind of hit the floor and, and come into light and, and really transform the galleries. Sure. So just to put this in perspective, what what's the last instrument you purchased for MIM, whether it was large or small or expensive or cheap? Uh, well, one of the real exciting ones actually that, that relates a bit to a uh, fretboard journal directly, there's a man named Leo Rayleigh, and he was a pioneering electric mandolinist back in the 30s. So he was uh, there with Bob Dunn and Cliff Bruner's band yeah. and some of the real early Western swing. And not too long ago, we were able to acquire a small collection of things from Leo Rayleigh's career from his son. So it's a, a 1965 A5 mandolin and a little bit older Martin teardrop style 215 mandolin and his Fender Deluxe amp that he was using at the end of his career. And these things are all just in beautiful condition, but the really cool thing is um, there's a man named Ted Daffin, who was a radio guy, not unlike Leo Fender, and Ted Daffin back in the 30s custom built a mandolin pickup for Leo Rayleigh that he would kind of attach, and I honestly don't know if he would uh, you know, use some kind of a putty or, or bolt it on or somehow rig it up like a Diarmond kind of style thing on various instruments over time. Um, but he used that pickup throughout his career. And so in addition to the instruments, we have that 1930s pickup that, that was really part of the career of, of a real pioneer in amplified music and Western swing music and all the guys like Tiny Moore and, and uh, you know, Johnny Gimbel and others, they were listening to these recordings from the 30s and it really paved the way. So that was a really cool recent acquisition. That sounds incredible. So this is a, a good question to follow up with. You get something like that. Um, is mm -hmm. there an inclination to, uh, obviously you want to preserve how you received it. You want to, don't let it degrade any further. Is there an inclination to try to get it back up and running <laughs> or do you just leave the mandolin where it's at and the pickup where it's at and, and move on? Well, generally we, uh, we do like to preserve it in the, the manner in which it would have been played by these artists. In some cases, uh, that's a real consideration for us because we also, ideally when we do acquire something in the collection, that's part of, of how it's been evaluated. You know, is, is it a basket case? Does it need a lot of work or not? And in this case, it was kind of a rare opportunity, but a lot of fun. Um, we occasionally do real brief demonstrations of things from the collection. And I was able to play just a few bars on that instrument through a 1930s Gibson amp, which would have been what Leo was playing back in the early days. And it's almost spooky. Uh, you know, if you ignore the bad playing on my part, you know, that's kind of an asterisk by the whole thing. But uh, that pickup running through a 30s Gibson tube amp, the sound is just almost exactly what you hear on the old records. And, I, you know, you can go on either a, like an archive.org or even YouTube and look up some of the old Cliff Bruner uh, tracks and the sound quality is really, really similar. So that was a, a really neat kind of eye-opening moment to see what it's like when you, you plug this same old pickup through the same equipment he would have been using, what, 80 years ago or so. And, and it really still does have that same sound quality. Another example, though, uh, 
in terms of recent acquisitions that were really, really exciting. We purchased Freddie Green's Gretsch Eldorado guitar from his son, Alfred Green. And so um, for people who aren't familiar with Freddie Green, he was the longtime guitarist for Count Basie's orchestra and just... uh, you know, virtually created a, a style of rhythm playing that people have been chasing down still, you know, trying to kind of perfect that really elegant, effective rhythm playing in a big band setting. And he was famous for having really, I mean, crazy high action on these big orchestral archtop guitars. And his son verified that you know, since dad passed away, we really haven't done anything to the guitar. This is exactly how it was. This is how it was set up. This is how dad played it. And it was thrilling to, to really take a close look at that instrument. And of course, we don't want to do anything to, to change it or to alter the, the setup because that was such a part of his sound and such a part of his technique and such a part of Freddie Green's legacy. And so uh, it'll be just a, a really, really exciting moment when that guitar gets up on display. But that was another recent acquisition where you'd almost second guess um, its condition and, and how it was set up and the geometry of the neck and the strings if you didn't know a bit about Mr. Green's history as a player. But there, sure enough, is the evidence this guy played with virtually superhuman action and it's just the coolest instrument yeah and uh does it become a slippery slope where you get that instrument and then all of a sudden you're thinking well it'd be really nice to get freddie green stromberg right alongside that or do you kind of just count your blessings and move on <laughs> it, 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 well it can be a slippery slope and again that's that's where um you know as long as we are telling musical stories with really strong authentic content um, we feel very proud to have the the right kinds of instruments without necessarily needing to have all of the instruments. And that was a consideration uh, because, of course, the family had both the Stromberg and that Gretsch. And for our sort of uh, principles here at MIM, what is most compelling to us uh, curatorially, and I think sometimes our audiences and our public programs teams and education teams can all rally around these stories. What are the instruments that were really uh, doing the job, doing the work of making music? And in this case, you know, that Stromberg for the collector market might have a different kind of an appeal or a different uh, status in the vintage guitar uh, environment, but the Gretsch is really what he played and played and played and played for 30 years or so. And so that's the one that, that just has Freddie Green's music still kind of coursing through it. There's a real aura around that instrument that has more to do with him using it uh, than it does, frankly, with being a Gretsch versus a Stromberg versus a a Gibson or anything else, uh, that was his main instrument. And that really spoke loudly to us in terms of wanting to portray his story. Yeah, that, that makes perfect sense. You have a pretty special exhibit going on right now, um, on the electric guitar. Talk to me a little bit about that and and how that came to be. Well, we were really lucky. Uh, there's a gentleman named Lynn Wheelwright. Sure. And he, in fact, uh, he contributed to your electric issue last fall Hopefully with that not extraordinary, yeah. yeah, that that Fender set, which is actually on display as part of uh, this exhibition, the electric guitar here. So that's really cool to have those pieces in the gallery. But Lynn had been a lender to Mim uh, since the early days. So we'd had a guitar on display in the jazz exhibit from Lynn is a really nice old ES-150 Gibson Electric. And so when I first started working here and learning some of our our pre-existing lender relationships and and learning the ropes a bit, I certainly was aware of Lynn being a lender and had seen his name in various publications. But he came to the museum and sat down and we had lunch together. And and frankly, that's when I first started really learning the depth of his personal collection, which was extraordinary and really just fun to think about. And it didn't take long before we were 
imagining the possibility of really mobilizing some special pieces of his collection in a museum atmosphere that could, you know, Mim is uniquely dedicated to telling these stories through the entry point of instruments. And of course, he has these amazing instruments um, that just beg to tell the story. And so it was a perfect fit. And we got to work and um, Lynn's collection forms the real core of the narrative because we're really telling the early story, largely pre-1950s. Um, and Lynn's collection is is really specifically focused to, um, to take great advantage of that story and to tell it in ways that very few other people could, I believe. And then we reached out to a select number of other individuals who were likewise really generous, letting us have things on display. And we ended up uh, you know, creating a narrative that really tells the very beginnings of amplified stringed instruments, including Lloyd Lohr's Vivitones and uh, the early Rickenbacker story and even some of the the amplifiers that predated the instruments themselves. So getting some of the the component parts to the story lined up so people can see the context into which these amplified instruments came into being and came into popular usage and and to walk through the gallery it's really I mean, it's just it's a real thrill to see these unusual groundbreaking instrument designs before there was really such thing as a a standardized electric guitar um but all the same what is ironic is that even before there was such thing as a standardized guitar the pickup itself hasn't needed to change a whole lot since the early 30s and it's just been this enduring kind of perfectly elegant solution to to that problem and uh, to see how they've repackaged that and redesigned it and kind of dressed it up decade after decade after, after decade and employed it in so many different ways is a real testament, I think, to the effectiveness of those original designs. Yeah. I know uh, you also have Speedy West Bigsby, which we just wrote about um, that yeah. Dick Dickerson acquired. Does stuff kind of trickle in at the last minute right before you're going to unveil an exhibit like this? That particular one was an unusual example of that happening, and we're so grateful for Deke's involvement. He's so knowledgeable as well. You know, we, we feel like if we've got Lynn Wheelwright on board and Deke Dickerson and some others, then then certainly we're getting right to the source of people who really know uh, and have access to these things. The Speedy West steel guitar was the last addition to the gallery. And in fact, we kind of uh, designed a space for it, knowing that that restoration was going to be right up to the wire. And in fact, it, it wasn't there at the very opening day, but it came in really shortly thereafter. And we'd known about it and, and Deke was telling us about its restoration process. And I thought, oh my gosh, that would just be the coolest inclusion if we're talking about, uh, you know, a lot of prototype instruments, a lot of first of their kind types of instruments that we wanted to include in this exhibition and having Speedy West personal Bigsby pedal steel, the first uh, kind of modern pedal steel guitar would be such a, a jewel of that narrative. And so we certainly wanted to make every accommodation we possibly could, but that was the, the one that came in, right at the end, but everything else was in-house because we have to make mounts and uh, do a bunch of custom fabrication for the ex exhibitions. And so we wanted to have fairly early access to those things, but, but Deke's Bigsby steel guitar was, was an exception that we were all, all too happy to make because it's just a stunning instrument. Yeah. What, uh, one of the big complaints that, uh, every guitarist of a certain age makes is like, but these instruments never get played. Um, do these instruments yeah. get played? Well, uh, that was another fun aspect of this project. We did play a handful of them because we wanted to demonstrate that just because they're, they're older doesn't mean that they're obsolete and certainly doesn't mean that they're irrelevant. So we actually had an opportunity to invite George Benson, to MIMS Performance Theater, and we set up, I think, about six of of the old electric guitars and invited him to play them a bit through a period-correct amplifier. And it was such a treat to hear, you know, a, a really masterful player picking up these instruments. And in some cases, he hadn't really ever thought about it. So there was a one of the old Bakelite Rickenbacker Spanish guitars, a mm -hmm. little 
tiny, almost peanut shaped uh, Bakelite Spanish guitar. And he looked at it and said, that's, you know, that's a span, that's a steel guitar. You don't play it like a, a normal guitar. And we said, actually, you know, take a look at the neck and it's set up and, and you can play it. And so he did, in fact, play that. And, and that was one where, to sort of paraphrase his reaction, he said, man, if I had had a guitar that sounded like this when I was first starting out, his whole concept might have been different. Like his whole career might have been different because it had this sustain and harmonic content that was so unusual to him and, and kind of exciting. And even though the neck was a little bit, you know, it doesn't play like a totally modern guitar. And so there are some, some issues of setup, but the sound quality itself he thought was really, you know, almost inspirational, you know, really was getting his wheels turning just in the first few notes. That was a lot of fun. So we did have an opportunity to play, you know, to, to have a qualified expert play a few of them. And then on our opening night, one of the real highlights of the project was uh, inviting John Jorgensen to play Charlie Christian's ES-250. And we really wanted to to celebrate the story of of Charlie Christian's music and contributions. And so on our opening weekend, John Jorgensen kind of orchestrated a, a recreation of the Benny Goodman sextet. And for a portion of that concert was playing Charlie Christian's personal guitar through an old, uh, you know, EH-150 amplifier and, and sounding like it should sound. It was really, really pretty extraordinary. That's pretty cool. Do you guys uh, ever share the footage from these concerts or anything? We have shared a little bit online. There have been little uh, kind of brief tastes of it. Uh, most of it does appear in the gallery at the moment. Sure. And we, we edited a few parts of it down to fit the, the video monitor content in the exhibition. But, but I think over time there could be opportunities to to revisit some of that footage and maybe pull out some pieces that that didn't get used you know as so often happens some some real gems um aren't published or publicized or or posted anywhere but we've got some really neat footage kind of in the can sure i i want to hear george benson on a rickenbacker i think that'd be (laughs) i don't i wonder if he sounds if it sounds more like a rickenbacker or if it just sounds like george benson but yeah it's fascinating well it, it sounds sort of like both. Of course, it sounds like George Benson, but what's most revealing is that all of these instruments, and they were all from the 1930s, they all sound like totally modern instruments. They have really great sounding pickups, uh, and it's then in the hands of the artist to, to make music. So obviously with George Benson, it's it's tough to uh, go wrong, and anything he plays is going to be kind of compelling. And there's a Vega archtop guitar with a big horseshoe pickup. And that was the one that really opened my ears because when Mr. Benson started playing that, of course, you know, he, he wasn't familiar with any of these instruments and it's a tall order to just say to a professional musician, Hey, we're going to drop an instrument in your lap and expect you to start feeling comfortable with it immediately. So there's always that little acclamation, but this old Vega very quickly sounded like he was just, he was just playing it, you know, and it sounded super and seemed like a really comfortable, contemporary, relevant, suitable jazz guitar for a, a jazz artist. So that was really neat to see a kind of a clunky old horseshoe, horseshoe style pickup bolted to the top of an old fashioned Vega archtop guitar. And it sounded just, I mean, it sounded phenomenal. It's amazing. This this may sound trivial, but maybe it won't. Uh, who is it your job to decide whether to change the strings on these things? Well, uh, <laughs> it's we've got a full time conservator as well, and so especially with loaned objects, ultimately, uh, it's not our job to to make those recommendations without the input of the owners. So obviously, that's that's kind of our first uh, line of inquiry is is discussing that with the owners of instruments that are on loan. Um, and, and we certainly try to minimize the amount of unnecessary handling, especially with older vintage instruments and, uh, you know, tuners that, that might be fragile or, or uh, need some sensitive treatment. So that goes for all the people who use and enjoy vintage instruments. I think you, you try to be a little bit frugal about the, 
the cycles of use you put them through and the cycles of maintenance that, that you want to put them through. But we also do that in close consultation with our full-time conservator here who has a, a real keen sense of what, uh, you know, what is easy to do and doesn't pose any kind of risk to the instrument. And uh, in those kinds of cases, let's get a new set of strings, certainly on the Charlie Christian guitar before a, a public theater concert. So we talked with John Jorgensen, we talked with Lynn Wheelwright, we talked with our conservator, we thought about what are the strings that are going to sound right with the amp, uh, what are the gauges that that John Jorgensen is going to feel comfortable with. So all that went in, and uh, I have very little to do with that other than uh, maybe facilitating some of the communication between all those other folks. Um, but it sure is fun to be a witness to all of it. Yeah, for sure. So we've got uh, the electric guitar inventing an American icon is going, I, this is going to air in mid-August. So it's got about a month left. What what comes uh-huh. next for you? Well, uh, for the museum in the same space where uh, we're currently hosting the electric guitar, we're really looking forward to a an amazing show about African masks and masquerade performance from Central Africa. So that's going to be really uh, something to see in that same gallery space. It'll be transformed to tell a completely different story. So the whole installation team, the whole collections team is going to be rallying around that project coming up in our kind of our signature space called the Target Gallery. In my corner of the museum, we have really thorough updates coming up to our country music exhibit in the United States Canada Gallery to our rock and roll exhibit because we have been actively pursuing some some neat new items for the collection and those get to a, a point of sort of critical mass and we realize it's time to really do a, a major redesign of some of the gallery spaces and so country music and rock and roll are both going to get pretty radical makeovers, which is going to be really, really satisfying to see. Nice. Are you able to, and and tell me if this is going too far or asking too much, but are you able to compete with, you know, obviously some pretty high profile guitars were sold at record breaking prices recently. Yeah. Are you able to compete with those or are you more going for, are you more, you know, discussing with the owners of these instruments? Like, Hey, it's going to get shared. It's not going to sit in some corporate guy's office like what what's the what's the balance there yeah from a practical standpoint uh we really don't compete with some of those high profile auctions so the david gilmore collection that just was sold and it was really exciting to know that that uh found a, a good respectable home um when you get into those high high stratospheres of cost we we just don't work in those those realms, but we do very fortunately know and work with a lot of people who who do continue to be generous. So in, in terms of some of those types of instruments, we do uh, tend to have those on loan basis mm-hmm. and people love the idea of sharing those stories. And that's either uh, coming from the hands of, say, private collectors uh, who have some really meaningful instruments or from the artists themselves. And so, you know, for instance, we're just thrilled to have Joan Baez's guitar on display as part of a new Woodstock display in our artist gallery. And it's her, her real Martin guitar, 1929 045 Martin that she played at Woodstock and through so much of her career. And so um, it, it's great that the museum sort of, encourages people to to share their content because they understand what it means they understand that their own music is sort of shoulder to shoulder with a whole world's worth of musical creativity and and that really appeals to uh, a certain portion of people who either are performing music still themselves or who have spent a lot of time uh, accumulating really nice personal collections and so mim uh, you know, we don't compete in terms of the multi-million dollar single instruments, but by nature of what we do, we've really been able to establish a reputation and identity such that some people who even own those things are really excited about sharing them and putting them in the context of the galleries here in the museum. Yeah, it's got to be great when you don't have to write that check. <laughs> yeah, and we, we write checks too, and we... we 
do that sensibly, and we certainly understand that there's a, a matter of investment in the collection that needs to happen. And so we, we try to be thoughtful and reasonable about where we apply those resources for things that we know have real lasting impact in a permanent collection. Um, so it's not to say that we, we never step out and, and really uh, seek nice, fine quality things of value for the collection, but, but we certainly are not there with a, a, a bidding number when it, it gets to the multi-million dollar uh, sort of celebrity notoriety instruments because we just we don't need to do that and we have the whole globe to cover and so it's really tough yeah. to justify those kinds of investments for let's say a guitar that might serve a purpose in one exhibit in a museum that actually has its interests spread across a, a much much wider scope yeah do you uh, do you get to go to some of those auctions though, and at least raise the paddle until it gets obscene? No, I, I haven't uh, done that, and um, you know we're aware of them when they come up. And frankly, with some of them, you can almost uh, predict, if not hope, some of the final destinations of some of those instruments. Um, but but some of those that are so uh, highly publicized ahead of time, with expectations that that we know in advance are just going to exceed our capacity to, to acquire things. We keep track. And, and in some cases we like to know where some of those instruments have, have gone because we might have relationships with the, the future owners anyway. And that lends its own opportunity to us down the road. Um, but we, we don't tend to get into the mix of, of the, the act of bidding when, when we just know it's it's not where we're going to apply those resources. Sure. And and you guys, as you said, have, you know, like obviously there's a, a great exhibit at the Met right now of, you know, iconic yeah. rock and roll instruments. You guys have always taken such a broader scope. I mean, the African mask, who who's the visionary behind this museum and, and who made that mission that we're going to cover not just stuff from America, but the the whole globe of musical instruments? Yeah, the museum was founded by a gentleman named Bob Ulrich, and he's the former CEO and chairman of the board of the Target Corporation. Okay. And so uh, when he concluded that part of his career, you know, he has traveled the world. He has a huge respect for cultures around the world and, and frankly, museums around the world and in artistic traditions. And the Reader's Digest version, as I understand it, is that, um, you know, he recognized that music had a an emotional connection in people's lives that is different from sculpture and painting and other art forms. He really recognized that, that music had a very, very strong sentimental pull, strong emotional pull, uh, taps into people's sense of heritage and identity. And it's a really strong, strong and fascinating artistic realm. And so uh, to his great credit, he, he did have that vision and thought, why not do a museum dedicated to music being one of these most powerful uh, expressive experiences we have as human beings and make sure we do it on a scale that acknowledges it happening all over the world because there are other places that specialize in a genre or specialize in Western classical music or, or even specialize in a national scale in museums around the world, but to have under one roof a celebration of music um, that is global in nature and, and really features the authentic instruments, not only as objects, but as, as tools for making music, was that was the vision. And it came about fairly quickly because he was really motivated to do it and to do it at a grand scale. And we're all... Uh, you know, really proud to to keep that vision, and if anything, just um, kind of keep on improving what people experience when they come through the door. Mm -hmm. And do you guys, uh, when you go from the electric guitar, then to African masks, then does it bounce back mm -hmm. to the Western world after that in terms of the special exhibits? It, it really does bounce around, and so um, you know, the last 
uh, let's call it five or so, have included a, a global purview of drumming and percussion instruments, and then a uh, project devoted to Cremonese violins, so these great Strad and Del Gesu violins from Italy. So we had a great tradition of European instrument making. Uh, then we had a selection of really fabulously inlaid guitars. Then we had ancient Chinese instruments dating back to 9,000 years old. So like archaeological, really extraordinary treasures from a museum collection in Henan province, China. So it was a, a real treat to work with them. And then the electric guitar coming back to North America, then African mass, Central Africa. So we do... I think owe it to the mission of the museum to keep those stories moving around the globe. There's no uh, absolute kind of calendar or cycle saying, uh, you know, every three, three years it will come back to this part of the world. So we just keep our opportunities open and keep our relationships with people around the world open such that we can kind of get these more immersive special exhibitions one a year. Um, but, but it is important to keep it, moving around. Yeah. I know, I know Richie made light of your playing, but I know, I know for a fact, you're actually a really good player of all the <laughs> instruments you've been able to touch, which ones, maybe they're not even celebrity owned. Which ones have just mesmerized you the minute you, you strummed on them or picked on them? Well, and that's the trick, you know, even being a little bit of a player, once we come into the, the environment of the museum, we, we become museum professionals. So they're really not played, certainly not in any kind of casual fashion. Sure. Um, and so I don't have a lot of experiences playing collection objects. I will say that there was one moment that stands out, and particularly because there aren't many moments to choose from, but there is a woman... Um, who does have on loan with us currently her father's very special Stromberg. It's a master 400 and I'd never seen one of those. And her dad was a jazz player and um, she was really excited to have the instrument on display so people could enjoy it and asked if I played guitar. And I kind of sheepishly said, well, a, a little bit, but you know, not compared to your dad, She says, gosh, you know, our family hasn't heard this guitar for so long. Would you mind just, playing it a little bit. And I was really humbled by that. Um, but at the same time, really excited because I'd never strummed a, a Stromberg master 400 and, and truly with like three, three strums of, uh, kind of my, my best earnest, uh, Freddie green imitation chords. It immediately made sense. Why, why those instruments have the reputation they do. And it was really, that was a memorable moment to to have access to a, a really fine old Stromberg and be invited to play it by the owner for a moment and, and to experience for myself. Yep. That's, that's what they do. And, and I've never played another instrument that does that job of projecting those, those kinds of chords with such a responsiveness and volume and, and everything that's been written about, um, I mean, that, that, that was a memorable moment, but those are rare because we, we take the instruments really seriously and, and our job is to preserve them. And, and they're not, uh, they're not casual items once they, once they get into this environment. Sure. It saddens me that when the lights go out and everybody, the public's gone, you guys don't all bust them out, but I understand. <laughs> yeah, no. And, and so we, uh, we're always cautious with that but um there there are those opportunities where we we have collection objects prepared for for playing use in fact uh, within the next couple of days we've got a really amazing 16th century harpsichord and we're looking forward to having a, a great player of early music have a chance to play a little bit on on this original instrument just so that we can all hear it you know because that is a part of preserving the stories of the instruments, it is important to know what they sound like, to know that they do work, to know that they are viable, exciting, expressive tools still. So um, as much as the general rule is we, we handle everything literally with white gloves, there are those moments when we recognize there are opportunities to, to uh, kind of cautiously and uh, selectively play them and, and see what they can do. Very cool. Rich, what, uh, I know it's mim.org is, uh, is the website Correct. for the museum open seven days a week, six days a week. How, how long? 
open seven days a week from nine to five. And then we also have a, a fantastic music theater, the MIM Music Theater, uh, where we have close to 300 concerts per year. So it's a very active performance like venue. You can check out that uh, calendar online as well at the same mim.org address. So in addition to the, the galleries being open seven days a week, uh, you know, throughout the week, we have just as diverse uh, live performance programming on the calendar in the, the theater in the evenings, typically. Nice. Thanks so much, Rich. This has been a ton of fun. And uh, again, the electric guitar inventing an American icon is running through September what? September 14th and 15th is our closing weekend. It's the same weekend as our Celebrate Rock and Roll public program. So it'll be a nice conclusion to a great exhibition. Great. Thank you so much, Rich. Thank you, Jason. It's really been fun.